Welcome to Politics Now. We bring you the newsmakers, and today we have a very special guest from the second congressional district from northern Nevada, Congressman Mark Amity. Thanks for being here, Congressman. Thanks for having me on, Steve. Uh, we appreciate uh, you uh, making the trek uh, all the way down here to uh, be here. You're kind of the unicorn in the delegation, right? You are the lone <laughs> Republican yeah. Yeah. in the delegation, and you have been for a number of years, as I recall. The unicorn's one of the nicest things I've been called. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So as, as the only Republican in the delegation, I'm sure that your constituents, whether they be Democrats or even some Republicans, have got to ask you, hey, what do you think about President Trump? Uh, you, you know, he said this, he tweeted that, you know, well, what's going on with President Trump? Is he, you know, do you stand behind him? All of that. Yeah. What, what do you tell those constituents when they ask you those questions? Well, you know, we concentrate more on since the president has, has a few people he talks to and almost all of them aren't me. <laughs> um, and some people are actually shot. Well, you talk to him. It's like, no, actually, I don't really talk to him much. Um, but, but what we do is, is we try to take maximum advantage of as the only Republican in the delegation to say, hey, for, for those people in Nevada who have issues with the administration, you feel a different responsibility than you did vis-a-vis -vis Nevada than you did when it was, hey, the Republicans are in charge of the House or, or that sort of stuff. So it's taken on a different role in terms of, of trying to be the conduit for those people with access, Republicans and Democrats, who, who want to get to the administration on an issue. So that's kind of what we've been. Although, you know, I get the stuff about, well, you were his honorary campaign chairman, and it's like, blah, blah, blah. And I go, well, quite frankly, I mean, yes. Um, but who else was he going to ask? <laughs> I mean, if you go back and look, it's like, you know, I mean, I started out with Bush, then I went to uh, to Rubio, and after I wiped out all those Florida Republican <laughs> presidential candidates, it's like, I'll support the nominee, and hey, you know, that's something that a lot of people overlook is, well, he was the nominee. True enough, true enough. Do you, in terms of his, the job he's doing, do you think he's doing a good job? There are a lot of Republicans who say, look, I don't agree with a lot of the controversies that he touches off on Twitter, but really that's distraction as opposed to what he's doing with the economy, which is good, you know, things are going well that way, and I support that part of it. Are you one of those Republicans, or what, what do you think of the job he's doing overall? I'm in the ballpark for that. I tell people, I say, listen, there were two reasons I voted for him. I, I, I didn't I didn't agree with, with Hillary, and I didn't support her. And the other one was is I wanted somebody to run the outfit. And while everybody's got ideas on style, he's running the outfit. And, uh, you know, there's an old saying in the law, if you got the facts, argue the facts. Mm. If you got the law, argue the law. If you haven't got either, just argue. <laughs> and so, uh, I mean, if I was on the other side, of course I'd be concentrating on the Twitter and some of that other sort of stuff and try not to concentrate on, hey, the, the guy's tackling the problems that he said he would, whether you like him personally or not. Um, and you can never say mission accomplished on the economy, but right now it's okay. You know, you got to keep delivering, but there you go. Yeah, he, he seems to acknowledge himself that the economy is his number one selling point. That, uh, you know, he said the other day, uh, hey, even if you don't like me, you have to vote for me because you got a 401k. And uh, it'll be down the tubes if you don't, uh, if you don't vote for me. You know, I didn't, I didn't ask somebody to confirm that. That sounds like something the president would say. <laughs> so I, I believe it. You know, the, the, the funny thing about Twitter, you had a, a great line the other day uh, where you said, look, I'm not going to get involved in these social media spats that people uh, uh, touch off. I didn't get involved when it was other people. I'm not going to get involved when, when, when it's a president. Has, has social media, specifically Twitter, do you think that has made politics worse because of the, the ease of, of, of access? the fact that people don't take the time to learn what was going on, the context of anything, and the ease with which you can just uh, uh, slam somebody on there and uh, uh, to your heart's content, usually behind the veil of anonymity, yeah. uh, you can just uh, yeah, do all that. Has that coarsened the discourse in the country and brought it down? You know what, I, I guess, and I've never been asked that before, but, but as you ask, here's the thing, is it part of the mix? Absolutely. Should it be part of the mix? Yes. But when it becomes the beginning and the middle and the end, I don't think that helps the issues. And, and that's part of the reason why when you, you know, the other day I said, listen, there's plenty of people doing that. What keeps my sanity in this day and age is let's concentrate on the issues. If I've missed something, then tell me what it is. People will still disagree with you, but it's like, and that's kind of an old fashioned stodgy thought. Mm. But, but quite frankly, when it all begins, ends, and in the middle stays in the social media, it's like, 
wow, the, the, the accuracy of that, and, and it wasn't created to be the accuracy, but it's, it's almost like when people used to say, hey, uh, I heard it on TV or I read it in the newspaper, it must be true, and it's like, well, you know what? Some of it probably is, but there are times when context and whatever, it just seems like that, you, you don't get that with the social media stuff. It's, hey, Katie, bar the door, whatever you put up, flies out there. Yeah, it, it, it is true. There is there is very little time to think about something and really parse the issue, find out, you know, who is this person on Twitter? I, I've never heard of this person and, and uh, do a little research, find out what that person's about before, you know, you pop off and say, well, you're an idiot and all that. And and uh, doesn't necessarily lend itself to uh, to Lincoln Douglas style dialogue. <laughs> I guess that's 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 <laughs> kind. So uh, so in terms of uh, in terms of your future plans, you you are the uh, a representative in the second district. Uh, it looks like there's other people that may be lining up for yeah. that job. You've got Can Adam you Laxall, who I mean. who ran for governor. He didn't uh, he didn't succeed. You've got uh, Danny Tarkanian recently moved into your district. He's now a constituent. So everybody uh, wants to be close. Yeah, and uh, and then you've got two state uh, state senators uh, where you came from, the state senate, Ben Keekeff and James Settlemeyer, they're in their final terms now, uh, and so uh, they may be looking to uh, to to uh, move up. W what are your plans? Are you going to run for re-election? Uh, are, are you worried about a primary challenge? What uh, What do you think? Well, you know, the, since I've been there, and and uh, what in September it'll be uh, eight years. Mm. Um, it's always been. I mean, there have been primaries. There, there's there's been contested generals. That's it, and, and it's every two years. So you know, it's interesting when people say, "Well, you haven't been around." It's like, what election cycle did I miss? <laughs> um, quite frankly, but you know, it's one of those things where I think CD2 is perceived as, "Well, this is a Republican stronghold," and it's like, you know, I remind people. I say, you know, Washoe County is about 50-50 yeah, on the registration, close. and they go, "Oh, it's all red up there." It's like. The last person I know that campaigned up there that said this is a Republican district and I'm the Republican survived by about that much. And so, yeah. while I don't want to ruin anybody's stereotypes, I think you still have to basically be somebody who knows the issues um, and, and knows the region and quite frankly has the ability to interact successfully in this day and age with these news cycles, this social media. Um, those issues, those organizations, just like you do here in, in Clark County, too. So, I mean, in terms of my plans, it's like I always sit down in, in, in between Thanksgiving and Christmas of this year and go, so how's it looking? Where are we going? Um, do we still want to, you know, do that? Or, and, and, or, you know, do you want to get out of the way and, and make time for somebody else? I'm a guy who supported term limits at the, at the Nevada legislative mm -hmm. level, and that was like 12 years. So. You know, that's something that I haven't gotten amnesia on or anything else like that. But, uh, you know, it's funny, though, Steve, I mean, the most motivational thing, because I don't think we've done anything that, that basically says you've just closed a door. But, you know, one of the, one of the biggest motivators, quite frankly, is, is that, that competitiveness. That's what makes you go out and say, okay, we're going to go in and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And quite frankly, there's stuff that, that's probably more pleasant. Hmm. But the opportunity to have that responsibility to make policy, to, to try to, you know, the public service is something that when that competitive thing, about the time somebody comes and says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically, you know, pin your tail to the fence post, it's like, well, we'll just see that, yeah. won't we? Is it, is it less fun now being in the minority than it was being in the majority? You know, it's different because I experienced a little bit of that in the state senate. Um, and, and that was a long time ago from what the state senate's like now. But I'll tell you this, I'm, I'm, and I know it's a good place to keep a secret, this may be a better, the 116th Congress may be a better Congress for Nevada th than the other ones that I've been involved hmm. in. Um, you know, you've got Nellis Creech going on, you've got Fallon going on, Clark County wants a lands bill, there's some other counties, and so the, I think there's some opportunities in the 116th where at the end of it, you might see the people from the delegation quietly going, hmm, wasn't too bad. Hmm. Um, the national stuff's still, quite frankly, uber politicized, but but we'll see. You know, you got to yeah. get up every day and try to turn the crank. The uh, the uh, speaking of national stuff, the, uh, the one of the big issues now is uh, gun control. People are calling for more uh, gun controls uh, in the wake of uh, Dayton and El Paso and yeah. Gilroy, and the list sadly goes on and on. Um, uh, you're known as a Second Amendment guy. Uh, what about this idea of a, of a universal background check, extending those gun store background checks that licensed dealers have to conduct now to all private party sales, just to ensure that the people who are 
prohibited by law from having a firearm can legally buy them. Well, I'm open-minded to that. I mean, the devil's in the details. Um, but, but listen, nobody's in favor of bad people having guns. Right. Despite what the political consultants will tell you in advertising <laughs> season. Um, but you sit there and you say, one of the things we do on every one, the recent ones, the, the, the one that sadly we had here in, uh, in October of, of uh, a year ago or two years ago, whatever it was, and, and so you sit there and you go, how did this person get those guns? Was it legal? Was it illegal? If it was illegal, then how come what was on the books didn't work? If it was legal, do we need to change what's on the books? But what we look for is, quite frankly, it's like, what's the cause and effect? We need to stop that. Uh, I did some, uh, had my folks do some research. I said, how many of these incidents did we have in the last year where statistics were available? And the answer was about 350 something. And, and, they, and they define a mass shooting as three people or more were, were I think injured or killed. Yeah. And so you go, how did those people get those guns? What's going on there? Because quite frankly, you say, well, that's, that's almost one a day. That's way too much. Okay, we need to go all in for that. But the other side of the coin is the, the, you know, the three million people in the country that own guns in a law-abiding sense that aren't, I, I mean, murdering somebody's been against the law since the Ten Commandments showed up, yeah. you know? So it's like, okay, so how do we do this so that we stop that from those folks that are doing and, and whatever's fair that actually does that? The challenge, Steve, I think becomes is is when one of these happens and, and, and one side goes, you got to get rid of all the guns, and it's like, why would you why would you abolish one of the amendments essentially, and punish 99.8 percent of the people who are abiding by the rules because you got two percent? Yeah, I mean, you you're, you're you're an attorney in addition to being a congressman, and uh, you served in the army, so you're familiar with weapons, familiar with the law. Could you even? do that if you wanted to under the current state of law if yeah. we said we're going to ban military style semi-automatic combat type weapons could that even happen i don't know boy it'd be a you know you, you look at i don't know that there's anything that's comparable but you look and say okay we're going to make sure that that people that that come into the country without an interview we're going to stop that it's like no we're not hmm. i mean quite frankly the numbers are too big and and blah 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 so i think that gets us to what are the lessons learned in 2018, for example, of the 352 people who did this? Was there stuff on the internet? Was there, you know, and so actually, one of the latest things is the red flag, you know, that's the name they're using, Nevada passed one. It's yeah. like, so it gives family members and law enforcement a specific button to push, and it's like, hey, as long as you're covering that due process base, let's see how it works, you know? I mean, I am worried, though, that I, somebody told me, Lindsey Graham said, hey, let's pass a law and let the states do that. It's like, really? We're going to let the states? How's that working on immigration right now? <laughs> you know, both of those things, uh, uh, the Second Amendment and immigration are in the Constitution. That's one of the things the feds are supposed to be doing. So with all due respect, Congress, even though it might be controversial, and oh my God, you might not win re-election, you really need to do that job. It's, I mean, it's specifically squarely in your, in your job description. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the, I guess the legal issue on, the, uh, on, a, on an assault weapons ban is secondary to the political issue because it's, it, it doesn't seem that it's very likely that something like that could pass. I mean, it, it would probably pass the House, uh, but, uh, but, but I, I just don't see that passing in the Senate. Well, and, and, and I think, quite frankly, the other thing is, and, and you hit on it in your question is, everything, in, in my view, most things that got over-politicized, the issues have been destroyed. Healthcare's a mess now. Immigration's a mess. Second Amendment's a mess. And it's all about politics. It's not like, how do we get the guns out of those 350 people a year? What do we do about immigration? We haven't touched immigration in 35 years. Come on. A few things have changed in 35 years. Yeah. But the, the, the politics of it has become so polarized that you've lost the issue. Hmm. Let's talk about immigration. Uh, since, since you brought it up, the, uh, the Senate in 2013 passed a bipartisan immigration uh, bill. Uh, the senators who were from Nevada at the time both voted for that bill, Harry Reid and Dean Heller. Uh, it passed the Senate by, I think, a margin in the 70s, yeah. which you don't hear about a lot. Yep. Uh, and uh, it came to the House. The House just ignored it, didn't take it up. Uh, uh, it died in the, in, in the House. 
could something like that happen today? Could a, could a bipartisan bill on immigration make it through, or as you pointed out, is it just too politicized to happen? You, you know what, I mean, on something as important as that, I mean, let's talk about Nevada. It's, it's one in four people in Nevada are, are, are folks that are affected directly by this. Mm. And, and so you sit there and you go, well, whether you like the issue, are comfortable with the issue, or don't like it and aren't comfortable with it, it's 25% of the population that's directly impacted. And when you get to indirectly, it's probably everybody. We probably really ought to you know, deal with that issue. And, and it's not a lot different in other states. Some of them are more, some of them are less, but not much. So it's one of those things where it's like, it's the 800 pound gorilla in the room. You need to do that. You need to deal with that. How would you do it? How would, how would a, what would a well, Mark Well, first of all, they like? say, you know, uh, comprehensive, it's like the word comprehensive has become a dirty word. So yeah. it's like, you know what, Dreamers and TPS folks, there was a bill that the House passed just a few months ago where it's like that ought to be low-hanging fruit. Now, I'm the guy who signed discharge petitions within the last three years. One of them, only two Republicans signed them. Um, the other one, we got to 216, two away, hmm. and Paul Ryan finally brought two bills to the floor, which a discharge petition does. Let us vote, not let's do it your way or my way. And, and so it's one of them things where I've said, I can't defend nothing. I mean, we should do something. So having said all that, it's like start with the Dreamers and the TPS. Mm -hmm. The problem with the bill that the House passed a couple months ago is, You've got a million and a half, a million six, a million and three quarters incredibly deserving people who are dreamers and TPS in this country. Why did you put in, oh, it's okay to be a gang member, it's okay to have a firearms conviction, it's okay to have domestic violence, um, you can't run a federal database background check. It's like, tell me the political upside of that. Why couldn't you have just done, and I mean, heck, the numbers are pretty, there's 70 some odd percent of people I think in the nation are like, yeah, do something for the dreamers. So if you had a clean bill that said all dreamers without criminal convictions. Without dragging across these kind of weird... Can have a pathway to citizenship and stay. Who would vote against it? I mean, there'd be some people. <laughs> there'd be some, but it'd pass, it'd pass big time. And I think in both houses, hmm. which gets you to when you talked about the Senate one, it never saw the light of day in the House. I was on the House Judiciary Committee when I got back there. We passed four or five immigration bills, you know, slugging it out, whatever the heck, and the D's voted against them, but they never saw the light of day on the floor either. Hmm. So the question becomes, John Boehner, Paul Ryan, because you guys were running it at the time, what was the problem with putting a bill on the floor? Yeah. Which is incredibly frustrating. Even, even during an administration with the president, George W. Bush, who would have probably signed uh, a, a comprehensive immigration re reform bill had it, had it got there. Guy from Texas, imagine that. Yeah. Um, th this child separation policy at the, at the border, it, it's been in place for a while, uh, but it seems lately like it's being used uh, aggressively not to uh, process immigration, but to deter immigration, to basically say, we don't want you to come here, and if you do, this is what's going to happen. Um, does that need to change? Does that need to stop? Well, here's the problem with what's going on now. We got kind of used as a country uh, since the Reagan administration to, well, we kind of had the flow we had. Uh, you know, it's interesting. February of this year, February 19th, Donald Trump signs an executive order saying we got a humanitarian crisis at the border. And, and I think he said we also have a, a, a public security or, or national security crisis. Yeah. And if you go back and look at the news reports, it's trumped up, it's made up, it's manufactured. Blah, blah, blah. My, Steve, what a difference 120 days makes. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, there's an emergency down there. We gotta get four and a half billion dollars down there as soon as possible. You say, well, what happened? The simplest thing that happened is quite frankly, the volumes in the last few years have made what we were used to for the first 32, 33 years look like kind of a, another day at the office. Hmm. And it's like, we've had for the first time groups of South and Central African folks coming across and joining up and coming across the southwest border with other groups. And so part of the problem is when you say you've got this separation policy, it might have worked okay before, but when you triple the number of people coming, facilities, personnel, everything yeah, that goes along with that becomes a mess. So that it, we sent four and a half billion dollars, that's not gonna fix it. That'll keep it from basically, you know, mushroom clouding. But there's a whole bunch of stuff in terms of that's just one of the symptoms where you go, hey, you really, really, really have to look at that mix of things. Part of it's security, part of it's humanitarian, part of it's how do you process people looking for asylum. 
it's not that, that, that we need to get rid of any of those things, but the, but the amount of volume that you do has become so much bigger that everything from, from bathrooms to courtrooms to judges to the whole nine yards is something where we're dealing with it on a scale that quite frankly you have to acknowledge and, and obviously the political thing is this, you got one extreme saying just let them all in and you got another extreme saying hey we've got school districts, we've got police fire, we've got public safety, we've got housing, we've got employment. So I, I don't think either side has the luxury of basically being able to say do it my way and forget everybody else. Yeah. The, um, on health care, you mentioned health care earlier, uh, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act was very controversial, barely passed. Uh, it, it, has, uh, it has been tinkered with since then. Um, but there are a lot of uh, elements of that law that uh, a lot of even Republicans like. The, yep. uh, the uh, a ban on denying somebody because of pre-existing conditions, the a ban on lifetime caps of insurance, uh, the children being able to stay on their parents' insurance till a certain uh, age. Um, all of those things. Uh, there are two. The Democratic Party is divided on this. Half of them, uh, the candidates that are running, seem to say, "Let's keep what we have and sort of build on it," and then the other half seem to say, "Let's scrap it and do Medicare for all uh, from the beginning." You seem more toward the the former camp than the latter. Yeah. A and so, uh, first of all, in terms of the people who want total repeal, do you agree with them or, or disagree with them? No. There are some good things in the Affordable Care Act. Political consultants don't like you to say that. <laughs> um, but, but quite frankly, there are some good things. And by the way, we ought to learn a lesson from the Obama administration just in rolling out expanded Medicaid. You know, that, that was a phenomenal challenge. And I'm not going to say they're bad people. It, it would have been a phenomenal challenge for anybody. So really, you want to blow the whole thing up and start over again? God help us all. And so those things, and you mentioned some of them, which quite frankly, those are good ideas. Maybe they need a little tweaking here and there, but you don't want to erase the blackboard and start all over again. Um, and, and now let's go to the other extreme, which is, you, you know, in, in the political posturing, it was like, it's perfect, don't touch it, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, oh, my gosh, uh, here we sit in, in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, where there are a few folks that are members of unions which work very hard in those bargaining to get the health care, yeah. the culinary plan, some of the other plans around. Sometimes the construction. even giving up wages. Yeah, to, to uh, God forbid. And so you sit there and you go, really, you're going to kick all those people off so everybody can be in one thing? How about your teachers? How about your public safety people? How about those folks that, that uh, you know, work in, in large industries? The Chamber of Commerce here kicked off a program that, quite frankly, was a phenomenal boon for those people who maybe only had a half a dozen employees. Yeah. It's in court right now, but we'll see where that ends up. But it's like, hey, giving people the ability to try to maximize their buying power for health insurance, over half the people in Nevada are on employer-provided health insurance. You're going to kick those people off? I'm not going to, unless I've missed something. You know, where it's like, oh no, this is really a good idea. It's like, so tell me why what I've missed. Because quite frankly, one size fits all, administered out of regional centers for something as personal as healthcare, which is prenatal to dead. You know, I remember saying, what's your Republicans' obsession with healthcare? It's like, well, it kind of really does affect everybody. <laughs> in, at all stages, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, so, so you would be in favor then, it sounds like, of a plan to say, okay, th this many people are covered now, there's some that are not covered. Let's find out why that is and come up with a way to cover those, whether it be association plans, uh, uh, insurance pools, things of that nature. There are plenty of ideas out there. The, the problem is, 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 like I said before and some of the other ones, that the po when the politics subsumes the issue, hmm. that's not good for the issue, in my opinion. Yeah. And so when you sit there and you say, well, pre-existing condition, even though the consultants had a blast with it, think about it, Steve. If you're running for political office and, you're, and, and, and nobody ever stood up and said, to heck with you if you got a pre-existing condition, because quite frankly, the way they define that, I don't want to say anything about you on the air, but I'm guessing you have a pre-existing condition. <laughs> I got several. Several. <laughs> you know, some of them think that if you're a woman, it's a pre-existing condition. Yeah. And so you're sitting there going, why would somebody who wants your vote say, if you have a pre-existing condition, good luck on, I mean, it's just, you sit there yeah. and go, seriously? But let me tell you what, there's a lot of folks that spend a lot of money saying that often enough and loud enough to where that's the perception out there. Um, but, but quite frankly, and as a guy who was born in 1958, baby boom generation, what, 20, 20 plus percent of, of, of the entire 
commercial activity of this country is going to be in health care yeah. shortly. So it's like you better deal with it in a way that makes sense. You know, the thing that everybody's pretty much forgotten, it's popped up a little bit lately with pharma, is the cost. So when you talk to people who run hospitals in Nevada who say, well, yeah, half of the, over half the population is private health care, but three quarters of the people in my hospital are single payer, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, uh, I don't include VA in there, although it's a single payer. Yeah, and so you sit there and you say, how come a box of Kleenex costs 10 bucks in the hospital? It's because, quite frankly, the federal government's done such a good job of saying, this is all we're going to pay you for Amidase appendectomy. And you go, well, I got to go make up what I lost on that on somebody who's, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield or United Healthcare or whatever they are. It's like, that's where we need to be going, hey, let's talk a little bit about this. Hmm. I'm a Republican, as you've mentioned. It's okay to make money and stuff like that, but when you look at the, uh, what the insurance companies, the private insurance companies have done in terms of their stock prices and their compensation for their upper folks, guess what? These last 10 years have been a wonderful time uh, yeah. for them to be in business. No kidding. And, and I don't want to... To say nothing like, of drug company. Well, and, and so quite frankly, you're sitting there going, hey, folks, let's take a little bit of a look because quite frankly, the government's going broke trying to take care of the baby boom types and others, and there's no reason they should have to do that. So mm -hmm. we need to get the focus back there, I think. One, one last area uh, uh, is uh, an area that you've really uh, done a lot of work in, and that's public lands yep. here in Nevada. The state of Nevada requested that the federal government turn over uh, about 10% of the federal land. Uh, most people know uh, who watch the show, especially that uh, uh, the federal government owns or controls about 87% of all the land in the state of Nevada. Yeah. The state asked for some of it back, about 10%. Uh, that resolution was later rescinded yeah. uh, when it got to Congress. So, in terms of in terms of uh, of that, do you do you think is there an appetite in Congress to turn over some of those lands to uh, the, the the state, or no? I don't think there is in, in a big way, just because it's one of those things where it's like, listen, we own it, and and we don't really think we don't want to own it, and the analysis for a lot of my colleagues isn't much different than that. Obviously, those people in the key committees are influenced by their staffs, and so I'll just tell you that, and I'm not picking on the public lands issue. There's other issues where you're going, well, okay, so this is the, this is the varsity of legislation. We analyze those things pretty deep. Some days you'd be surprised on how shallow they are. Hmm. But I is tell that because most of the people are from states where the federal government owns very little land? Yeah, they just don't conceive. It's like, hey, we get property tax, we get this, we get that, and Bob, it's like, well, when 85% of your tax base is is basically paying 57 bucks an acre a year in Pilt. Mm. I mean, 57 cents an acre a year in Pilt. Yeah, I was say it, it's you. like, you know, Pershing County gets like a million bucks, and that's Lovelock, the home of Burning Man, uh, by the way. Yeah. And you're like, hey, you want to give them the, you want to give them the 600 acres that they hold Burning Man? They'd probably give you your million bucks a year in Pilt back, uh, and they could make it the other way. But here's the one that I love, and it's why I think this could be an interesting one for Nevada, because you got Nellis Creech, Clark County wants a bill. It's been 21 years since the Southern Nevada Public Lands Management Act, which was all the, you know, the, uh, the, the auctions around here. Yeah. One of the fastest growing areas in the nation, in the Southwest, we'd compete with the Valley of Sun, all that. The original bill, Steve, authorized 70,000 acres to be sold. You know how much has been sold in 21 years? A little over 35,000. So there's quite a bit left. Well, my point is this, because they're like, oh my God, they're blowing and going down there and the desert tortoise and blah, blah, blah. It's like about 1,700 acres a year is what's been sold on the average. Now, I'm not saying, I mean, you still got to care about the desert tortoise. You still got to care about air quality. You still have to do responsible growth, city councils, county commission. But 1,700 acres a year in the most dynamic, for sure, in Nevada and for most of the nation, metropolitan area is not exactly drop the bulldozer blades and keep them fueled up until they go over the horizon. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what we fight here is, is that cliche of this is all bad stuff. Yeah. Well, Congressman, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, come down here. We have a lot to talk about, uh, so, uh, so we hope you come back uh, sometime in the future and uh, uh, meet with us again. I'll be happy to. I just wanted to get down before it got really hot, Steve. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> you made it just in time. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again. You bet.